some universities more successful than others? Which factors are responsible for the ups and downs of the intellectual reputation of a university? At the dawn of the Middle Ages, universities were the source of a new thinking and the spearhead of modernization. But they were also a child of their time and space. They were and are related to the intellectual heritage of their region and the goals of their founders and financiers. Geographies of the University this is the title of this 12th symposium of the series Knowledge and Space at the studio of the Villa Bosch. The panels bring together scholars from around the world and from different disciplines. They present their perspectives on how universities can perform as key actors in the global knowledge economy. Martin Kinzinger is professor at the Department of History at Münster University. His research focuses on universities' founding period in the Middle Ages. Before we can take a look into the future, we first need to know more about the past. Professor Kinzinger, which were the incentives <laughs> for the founding of universities in the 12th to the 14th century? Yeah, one has to differ. In the 12th century, the principal idea was to find a new kind of knowledge of science, that is, how to ask questions in a new way. Not to reproduce tradition, but to just to ask logical questions, which is possible in every circumstance in the whole life. This was fascinating for young people, especially young men, intended to find these teachers and to find others who are also interested. So there was an impulse coming out from the younger generation, so to say. The first universities, like in Bologna and Paris, were founded by the scholars themselves. In Montpellier and Salerno, the universities emerged from the local medicine schools. Most medieval universities started as law schools, which meant at the time theology. So, is there a difference between the early universities and the later successors? Later on, it was more and more undermined, so to say, by the pragmatical argument to get learned personnel, learned um, administrators, lawyers, counsellors, for in principle for the service of princes, for the courts, but also for the church. Not in order to support knowledge, nor science, nor liberty, but in order to get learned um, officers for later times. The newly established 12th century universities in northern Italy and France were the start of a movement which has not ended yet. Howard Hudson is professor for intellectual history at Oxford University. So, Professor Hudson, what would be the historian's perspective on a university? So what we would look at is, you know, the, the role which the university has played in Western civilization now for nearly a thousand years. That itself is a remarkable uh, statement. The university is one of the most important uh, institutional developments of the Middle Ages, and, and our universities, like the University of Heidelberg, are amongst the most uh, enduring institutions of Western civilization. They're, they're enduring because, of course, they've embodied some of the fundamental ideals of Western civilization. The modern nation-states have used universities as an instrument to change society, to advance certain fields of industry, and to improve economic performance. The 1960s and 1970s experienced a boom in establishing new universities. Great Britain, for example, almost doubled the number of universities in the 1960s, intending an academic revolution. However, this also entailed a stronger control of universities by the state and more influence of politics. Even private universities are influenced by political decisions. Now we know more about universities in the past. Let's take a closer look at the present and possibly the future of universities. 
So, Professor Cochrane, what are important policies for the success of universities in the future? Universities, in a lot of ways, succeed in spite of the policies that they're surrounded by. They're significant institutions and they have found ways to survive all sorts of pressures that come down on them, relying on students, um, relying on student money from students, relying on money from other sources. Uh, they're constantly, they're very clever at looking for ways of surviving. However, I think there's an argument uh, that universities need to be freed up, need to be enabled to do things more easily. Instead of having to look for ways to survive, they should have ways of being encouraged, we should look for ways of encouraging universities, of enabling universities to do things that are worthwhile. The higher the scientific reputation of a university and the larger its resources, the more it acts as a magnet of talent and brains, and the more it will disseminate ideas and scholars throughout the world. Today, there is a global race among the universities. They compete for the best students, researchers, and cooperation partners. They'll learn. They're learning organizations. They sometimes learn the wrong things. They sometimes learn how to discipline themselves, to police themselves. Some of the ways in which we try to compete in terms of global rankings, in terms of citation, indices for research, and so on, makes us discipline ourselves. We behave in ways which don't always make sense because what we actually should be doing is trying to collaborate, cooperate between ourselves uh, as academics. We don't have princes anymore but we have the tendency for instance to um, economize or how to say uh, universities. Universities are no business. University is no administration. It's university. Within all other circumstances and I think this tradition is very important for us to, to sustain and to keep alive. Universities originated in Europe, but today they are a global phenomenon. The geographies of science study global spaces of knowledge production. They focus on international cooperation in research and investigate international networks of scholars and the emergence of global education hubs. In countries outside Europe, Without a long historical tradition of universities, new universities, international branch offices, science parks, technology parks, and many education programs are built from sketch. Alexandra Den Heyer is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Architecture at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. She studies university campuses in Europe and is interested in how a city and a university cooperate in order to create excellent conditions for scholars and students. Which functions and services should the university provide the students with? Well, traditionally uh, the university planning was only about academic functions, so laboratories, classrooms, libraries, and that could all fit into the city. And, and that's what the only thing they cared about, actually, or they had to care about. But increasingly it's about residential functions, it's about retail and leisure, it's about incubators to startups to enable them to be part of the campus and, uh, and all the public space and infrastructure that connects it. We know a lot about the history of science. But what do we know about the geography or spatiality of science? Scientific practice varies from one place to the next. Each university location affords a student a different knowledge environment. Such knowledge environments have an impact on scientific practice, on the attractiveness of scientific institutions, and on the career and mobility of scholars. The head behind this series of symposia, Professor Peter Moisberger, Distinguished Senior Professor of Economic and Social Geography, is interested in questions such as, how can we define knowledge environments? What impacts can a university have on the society, culture, and the economy of its region? So Professor Moisberger, why is it important for someone with interest in geography to study the success of a university? 
Well, universities are nuts of the global uh, knowledge economy. Universities have a great impact, uh, not only on economy, but also on various uh, indicators like voting behavior, educational behavior, uh, the uh, consumer behavior. They have a, are a big economic factor for each uh, town. But also the impact of knowledge milieus on scientific success, on mobility of scholars and on careers of scholars. Due to its infrastructure, a university shapes its environment fundamentally. It also has great impact on its town and region. Johannes Glückler is a professor at the Institute of Geography at Heidelberg University. So, Professor Glückler, what would you say is the regional impact of a successful university? Um, the regional impact of a successful university is manifold and everybody knows that. There are many qualitative impacts on the very long term. For example, a university's innovativeness, um, scientists who innovate, who spin off private enterprises that later on have an enormous growth, as for example SAP in this region uh, serves as a very good example. But those effects are usually very difficult to assess in monetary terms because they're so long term and they're so qualitative. What we have done in our research is to assess the short term economic impact of the spending of the university and all its members, including employees and students. And the very short finding in this is that a university uh, multiplies um, the public input, public money, subsidies input, um, by a factor of about um, 2.3 euros. So the net spending of the, of, of, um, the federal government, for example in Baden-Württemberg, um, produces an outcome on the economy of about 2.3 times. Universities are more than centers of research, teaching and expertise. They also have a significant economic, social and cultural impact on their region. Henry Etzkovitz is a professor at the Stanford University in California. At the Triple Helix Institute, he teaches how universities can be an engine for economic and social development. So, Professor Eskowitz, um, what are the secrets to success for a university? <clears throat> the secret of success, and I don't think it's really a secret, but it's really uh, well known, is that the university should pick an area to focus on in which it will take uh, leadership in a field. And once it's achieved success in one area, it can move to a second. And these, ideally, to gain the most support for the university, should have two characteristics. One, it will lead to theoretical advance, and two, it will lead to practical implications that will help the economic and social development of its locality or region. Town and gown depend on each other. The linkage between such an influential institution and urban structures is most often highly visible. After hundreds of years, due to the continuous inflow of the brightest minds and an exchange of global knowledge, the city and the university often started forming a symbiotic relationship. The university and the city are a good marriage. I would say. Um, the university uh, provides the students and the, and the young people to, to the city that make a lively city and, and the city provides uh, the history of Europe and of Heidelberg in this case that um, you know, students are attracted to. So all cities and in, you know, a lot of European countries still have the heritage buildings of the universities of the past that are still the universities of today and will be the universities of the future. Heidelberg University is a perfect setting for this symposium. Founded in 1386, it is the oldest university in Germany. Here in Heidelberg, there are plenty of study facilities, institutes as well as libraries. A high number of options to enjoy leisure time ensures a high quality of life for both students and staff of the university. As Heidelberg is a very small city, more than one-third of its inhabitants are either students or work for the university. 
Originally, the campus was within the city walls next to the daily lives of Heidelberg's inhabitants. Its first professors came from abroad, Paris and Prague, so it was international from its very beginning. Since medieval times, scholars and students have been expected to be geographically mobile. Mobility can inspire new ways of thinking and bring about new relationships and cooperation in the world of academia. Within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, the Repertorium Academicum Germanicum follows all traces of academics between 1250 and 1550. The education and work life of more than 50,000 scholars are displayed in this database. The aim of this project is to understand how academics contributed to the fundaments of the medieval and early modern knowledge-based societies. These maps about the catchment areas of scholars show how the significance and influence of universities changed in the course of time. Ten Nobel Prize winners have taught here, and 45 other Nobel Prize winners have a relation to this institution. Heidelberg is located in one of Europe's regions with the highest research intensity. Its attractiveness as a city of science or pearl of knowledge stems not only from the university, but also from a dozen of other research institutions. And with regard to your vision, what is your impression of Heidelberg University? Heidelberg, in many ways, right, is a long tradition. It's got a very long tradition. It's got a long tradition of success. It's got a long tradition of academic excellence. It's also got a tradition of collaborative working, as I understand it. I mean, the interesting question for someone like Heidelberg is Heidelberg is located in quite a small, a small town city, or city, I mean, you know, so, so how does it manage to build the relationships that an institution of this size might expect to have with wider communities? Because the wider communities aren't all here. So if you were in, I don't know, in Berlin or Hamburg or Bremen, you could talk about um, wider, wider communities. Here, you may also have to think just more creatively about the region, about other other ways of, of contributing, other ways of, of, of doing things. But it's certainly the case that um, all the evidence suggests, first of all, that Heidelberg University makes a huge contribution to the regional economy. I think it already has a long tradition of collaborative working, which allows people to do creative things. It also has a tradition of actually being in contact with the local community, uh, with the local uh, city, and then also with some other external bodies, including, including businesses. Talent, motivation, and wealth of ideas are not the only characteristics determining the outcome of research. A huge number of external factors come to bear as well. Next to many others, these are a university's financial resources, its research infrastructure, the scientific stimuli, and its organizational structures. This series of symposia on knowledge and space deals with a wide variety of issues. What do we know about the spatiality of knowledge or the impact of knowledge environments? What are the main results of these interdisciplinary discussions? These questions are answered by the book series Knowledge and Space. But part of the difficulty with the modern university though is that we no, have no longer are having a, an ongoing interdisciplinary discussion of what our core mission is. One of the things I found most useful in our discussions here in Heidelberg was precisely to get a broader interdisciplinary discussion of the purposes of the university, the way in which the university needs to be organized, spatially and otherwise, in order to pursue its core function.